Good evening. Good evening. Number 542 will be our first song. We'll sing the first and third verse, and then Brother Mark Morris will come and lead us in our opening prayer. And Gary will have a couple of announcements. I think Joshua's going to have the devotional tonight. 542. <clears throat> Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joy departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You have no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do you feel the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What will be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You have no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone.
strengthen one another. And Father, we pray that tonight each one of us has come here to encourage each other and to be brought up in, into a better knowledge of your word. Be with those who have a leading part in this worship service. We pray that they will do their jobs well, especially with Josh in a moment as he breaks the bread of life to us. And Father, be with each of us as students that we will listen attentively, that we will participate as we are able, and that we all can be more effective servants of yours after we leave this place. Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In the name of Christ. Amen. 909 will be the song of invitation. 909. Uh, after I make the announcements, Joshua will offer the invitation and give us the devotional. We have a few announcements to go through. Actually, it's more than that. But um, Berna Brewer is not doing well. Um, as I've said in the bulletin, they've suspended her treatments. And we need to remember her, especially now in our prayers. Um, I know that uh, Paul Moore is here tonight, and good to see Paul and able to be here. Um, Michael Hauser was taken back to the hospital in Mayfield yesterday, I believe it was, and he uh, was having some bleeding and so forth. They have him back in the hospital right now, and his hemoglobin is low, uh, so there's a possibility of a transfusion uh, later on. But uh, please keep him. He's having some difficulties there. Uh, Jim Langford is here. I know he had another treatment Monday, and he just now gave me the thumbs up. So I guess that means he's just doing fantastic. It makes him, he, he can't wait to have another one uh, tomorrow. All right, so tomorrow. So they're going to be making another trip to Nashville. Uh, also, Kim Jones has been having some severe arm pain and things that, She's going to have to see a doctor about that. The Mackeys have had COVID, but they're doing much better. And uh, I, Brother Humphreys, as Mark mentioned in his uh, prayer just a moment ago, uh, they, he was to have a heart cath Monday. They determined that he had several blockages. He really needs to have bypass surgery, but his age and general condition and everything that they elected not to do that. He is at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville, and they are trying to determine what to do. Uh, there are several possibilities. They're just looking at uh, what they can do, what the best is that they can do for him. And so we need to keep him in our prayers. Kyla Penny, the niece to Angie Joyner, uh, was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and Cindy told me uh, the other day that she is uh, not doing well, got some bad news from her doctor. Uh, young mother, three children, and uh, we, need to, we need to remember that family. Uh, Daryl Jones, and he's a cousin to Wayne and, I, and good friend to Troy Spicelin. They work together and things. One of the elders over at the Sunny Slope congregation, Daryl's just a good man. And uh, he had surgery, he came home, but uh, he's got an infection now, went to Baptist, and then they sent him on back to Vanderbilt. Uh, so they, that family is down there. So these immediately are the ones, and I didn't get everybody, I just tried to highlight the ones that, were, uh, that we just have the most recent updates on. But these are the ones that I know about, and if you don't mind, please let me know if you have others that need to be mentioned. We, want to, we don't want to leave anyone out. Kay and I will be getting the bulletin put together, so we would like to have all the announcements about things like that if you have anything. Joshua? If you have your Bibles and would like to read with me, turn to 2 Corinthians. In the first chapter, as the book opens, as this letter from Paul to the church at Corinth opens, he shares some words starting in verse 3 that I'd like to read with you at this time. 2 Corinthians verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, and if we are comforted, 
it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, and we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Paul says the words comfort and suffering a whole lot in a few verses, and that's not on accident. But if you read a little bit more about Paul and, and you study a little bit more about Paul's life and, and the journeys that he went on and about his ministry to the, the churches in the first century, you don't have to study very long or you don't have to dig very deep to find a suffering in Paul's life. Now what you do have to look for rather is to find the comfort in Paul's life. Because as someone who places such an emphasis on comfort in these verses, it's, it seems obvious, and the glaring difference, it seems, is that Paul's life wasn't filled with comfort. Paul's life wasn't filled with, with a lot of, of normality. It wasn't filled with, with a lot of stability. Rather, Paul suffered many persecutions and he moved from place to place and a lot of times he was in need and he was in want and he was imprisoned and there wasn't a lot of comfort in Paul's life. And the world around us is full of trials, it's full of tests, it's full of suffering. We also get to experience a lot of physical comforts and, and blessings that Paul and, and a lot of those in the first century, especially Christians who had been so persecuted, didn't get to experience. And so what is it that makes Paul so confident in this comfort? Not only in his own comfort, but in the comfort of others as he was writing this, this letter. And the answer is that Paul understands that the source of his comfort is God. And the source of his comfort is is a promise that although he may be experiencing suffering in the flesh and he may be experiencing suffering here in this world and in this life and at this moment, he may be suffering right now. But in spite of all of the suffering that a man can endure in the life that he lives on this earth, Paul finds comfort and security in the fact that no matter what happens in this life, and no matter what uncomfortable situations this life puts him in, that he has a promise to fall back on. And he knows that when this life is over, because it's finite, and it may stretch on a long time, and Paul, he didn't know how long his life would last, and he didn't know how long his sufferings would last, and he, he didn't know whether each imprisonment that he went through would be his last, or if he would be executed at this point or that. Paul didn't know how long his life would last, but he did know that at some point it was going to come to an end, or Jesus was going to come back first. And you and I have the same knowledge. At some point... Either my time on this earth will run out or Jesus will return to take me home. And at some point, this life in this world full of trials and, and hardships and uncomfortableness and suffering, it's going to be up. It's going to be over. But what comes after that is where I find comfort. Because what comes after that I know, and I'm sure of, and I have a promise that not only will I find comfort in the presence of my God in a way that I can't experience here on this earth, but I'll have it for eternity. When we find Paul the most comforted, when we find Paul the most encouraged and uplifted, when we find him in the best of spirits, is when he's talking to, writing to, or spending time with those who are of a like mind, those Christians who, who he loves so dearly, those people he considers family, because of the tie that binds them together and the promise that they share. 
That's a promise that's for everyone. And it's for you and it's for me. And it doesn't matter what's happened in your past. And it doesn't matter the sins that you've committed. The promise is available. And it's up to us to take our part in accepting that promise and that offer that God has given us of forgiveness if we just follow His will. If we just do what He's asked us. If we follow His plan and if we listen to His word. If we're baptized with Him and we die the death that He died on the cross, we die that death to sin and we're raised to walk a new life with Him, that life never ends. And although this world ends, and although our physical life ends at some point, if we maintain a right relationship with God, that spiritual life with Him, that spiritual walk with Him, that comfort that we find in His presence, and strength that we find in His arms, never, ever ends. That's the comfort that we have. In this life, And the confidence that we have in the next. The invitation is open to you tonight if you've never taken that promise. And if you've never found that comfort. And if you have and you need to make sure that you're in a right relationship with him. Then do it now. And don't wait because you don't know when the end of your time here on this earth is. But you do know what comes after. Make sure that you are in a right relationship with Him so that you can be with Him for the rest of forever. If there's any way that we can assist you tonight, would you come and pray with us as together we stand and sing. There's a mountain preaching for you and me Let's take some pains to its brink Here's a fountain of blood from the source above when he bids us all freely drink, will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? It's for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Here's a fountain open for all. Milton Jones will direct us in our closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed to our classes.
I did forget to mention two things. Uh, Milton's uncle, uh, Elvis Rambo, is uh, in hospital. They thought he had a heart attack the other day. I was trying to remember all these names off the top of my head, and that's, that's kind of a dangerous game for me to play. But uh, at any rate, I forgot them. And then uh, Don Worley went out the other day. Uh, James Riley has a great big old garden. And Don went out there and sacrificed uh, life and limb to get turnips. If you like turnips, we've got a box of turnips back here. We've got the white kind, and then we've got the purple top kind, and there are bags there. And if the bags are gone when you get there, just put them in your pockets. <laughs> and if the police get suspicious, don't worry about it. Just say it's turnips. You know, but uh, anyway, good to see everyone tonight. We're glad that you're here. And uh, we have visitors with us tonight from Lawrence County, Tennessee. And it's good to have you all with us. We got to talking. I, if, I, I, if I know of anybody in that area, I have to ask, well, do you know them? And they did. So uh, good to see them. Glad that you all made it tonight. And glad to have you as part of our class. Uh, we're on page 38 of the lesson here. And let me remind you before we get into the lesson proper that... Um, what uh, we, I mentioned to you, mentioned to me anything that you would like to study for the next quarter. And uh, we'll start on the first Wednesday night of the new year. Uh, I'll pick out one of these and we'll go through with it. I've had several suggestions. Uh, one of the things that I had mentioned, uh, one was, uh, let's study the seven ones of Ephesians chapter four. Uh, there when he talks about endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And it uh, goes through the, uh, there's one Lord, God, and Father, baptism, church, things like this. That's one topic that would be good. Uh, the one that I had mentioned was some difficult Bible text. And I'm talking about the Bible text itself, that there's a passage that maybe is unclear or causes some confusion or something like that. And I would try to take one a week and discuss those. So if you have something uh, and you might think of another one. If you think of another one, that's fine too. Not a problem. Uh, but uh, if you have anything, like in the one on the difficult Bible text, if you, have a, if you come up, and I did last, sun, uh, last Wednesday after we got done, uh, Dennis came up to me and he said, well, I have one. And so we talked about that for a little while. So let me know, and I'll be glad to put these uh, on the list and kind of go through and see what we can do with that. Well, here on page 38, we were talking about what should we do in the face of persecution. We were talking about Jesus in the, in the last two, I'm going to say the last two Beatitudes, but they are pretty much one and the same, and that has to do with persecution. We dealt with the fact that there is a persecution that we could possibly endure, but then there's another type of persecution that's more uh, spoken than it is actual physical activity against us. And Jesus is, that's the one that we're dealing with right now. But in the last lesson on persecution in general, I asked the question, is persecution always bad? And we found out that no, it's not always bad. As a matter of fact, there are some good things that can come from it. And in this one, I'm asking the question, well, what do we need to do in the face of persecution, especially when others are uh, saying things about us, as Jesus said, when they speak things falsely against you for my name's sake. Well, we got to the second one in this addenda last week about uh, bearing through our afflictions patiently. One of the things in Scripture, patience is brought up in Scripture as something that God's people are to have. Uh, it's, uh, you see it you know, throughout the Bible, but especially in the New Testament. You have this idea of patience. And when you talk about uh, patience, it's uh, sort of a long-suffering. It's the idea of waiting and so forth. You know, you've heard this whole thing, when you get, to, when you get angry, count to what? Count to ten. I think I get to two just about every time, and that's as far as I go. But uh, count to ten, and hopefully by the time you get to number ten, you, you know, things uh, are not quite as bad or something. But uh, sometimes there's a tendency on our part to jump the gun. And maybe we make assumptions about things that we find out later are wrong. And if we had been a little more patient about those things, thought them through and so forth, we might begin to see our way clear of, uh, of trying to resolve this issue, especially if it involves going to a brother or sister in Christ or anything like that. 
So patience is one of the things, and I point out here that we're to bear them patiently. Uh, incidentally, um, you go through the Bible, uh, and one, once again, let me um, encourage you, if you've not read it, let me encourage you to read um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And Fox's Book of Martyrs, I think, will impress you with the faith that these people had and the patience that they had as they were going through the sufferings and trials and things like that that they were enduring. It's a very good book to read. There is another book called Early Christianity by Roland Bainton. If you can find it, you'll be very, very lucky. Uh, it's a good book, but he uh, goes through some of the early sufferings that the church endured uh, and things. The book itself, I, I have a paperback copy of it somewhere, uh, probably in my library. I'd have to look to see if I could find it, but it was an old, old copy that I had. So if you were to find it, you, you'd be very fortunate to find that. But Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, and one of the things that I'm impressed with is how many times the Christians were put in situations where they were going to be put to death, and yet they were very patient in that time and suffered through these things patiently. Uh, that is something that is very prized uh, as far as uh, Christians having patience and things. But, oh, Mark? One, one thing we might remember, too, and I know you put First Peter in here. First Peter talks a lot, really, about suffering and glory. A lot of times mm -hmm. we think, well, suffering's over here and glory's over here. No, they're hand in glove. They mm -hmm. come together. Um, the Old Testament prophets had a real problem with this. Many of them, it seems, thought that we suffer now and we have glory later. Yeah. But Peter really nails it down in First Peter that they're suffering in glory. The two go together. Uh, Jesus was glorified by the things which he suffered. Mm -hmm. That would be our supreme example of that. But the things that we suffer today, if we do them, endure them as a child of God should, they glorify God. There is glory for God and back in kind of, you might say, a mirror image in us when we suffer that way. He makes a good point on that. And one of the things, too, is as we go through these things and suffer, we also uh, send a message to those who are initiating the persecution against us. Yeah. That, that is, Job is a... And we studied Job. It's been several years ago, and that may be something that we kind of need to go through uh, because Job is a wonderful example of somebody who endured. I will say he wasn't always patient, but he, would, he did endure. Dennis? We also have to remember that the Bible is written in a language and applies to all time. Yeah. Yeah, we're very fortunate. India and all the other countries over in the Middle East and anywhere you go, you can be put to death at any time for what you believe. Mm -hmm. We don't worry about that. We worry about somebody calling us a name. We worry about somebody calling us a Camelot here. You know, and yeah. we, don't, we don't realize, unless we've been in other parts of the world, what actually goes on in other parts of the world in third world countries and Second world countries, we just don't realize that those people over there still think persecution that's the first Christian. Yes. Right. There, yes, the, there are countries around, uh, especially countries that are dominated by the Muslim religion, especially there, but there are other places and things. Those, those people there, if they become Christians, their own families will put them to death. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It does around the world, and uh, one of the things, and I want us to be cognizant of the fact that if you listen to messages today on the news and things like that, it'll be ever so slight, but sometimes our things are said to uh, denigrate Christians. Uh, Don, you had your hand up.
Yeah. Right. The, the, yeah, and that's where, you, well, you're keeping your eyes on the goal. You're keeping your eyes on the, uh, the Hebrew writer uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the, uh, the weight that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he saw ahead. And that helped him to carry on, you know, uh, you can, uh, if, uh, it's just like going to the dentist. <laughs> he says, I'll be done in a few minutes. Well, I can't wait till he gets done. Let's, you know, get that over with, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a phrase. I love that phrase. I, I love that phrase. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. We all have our Fridays, but we have to remember Sunday is coming. Notice on there that I go on to number three, use your rights under the civil law to seek protection or redress. Paul appealed to his rights under Roman law as a Roman citizen. And the passages that I give there, and incidentally, uh, not just these passages, but if you will look at the context, you will find, for instance, Paul uh, in Acts chapter 24, uh, 23, 24, and 25, there are several things that are brought up there. And among the things that are brought up is that the Jews, there were some Jews who had made a vow that they would not eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. Uh, I'm thinking those fellows died of starvation later because Paul's nephew heard what was going on. He goes and tells Paul, Paul calls the authorities and he tells them. And when Paul is uh, sent on his way, that he is accompanied by 200 soldiers 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, and uh, I've forgotten the last number what it was. In other words, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of four or 500 soldiers, military men, and they surround Paul and take him on his way. Did Paul utilize his rights? Most certainly did. And later, under Festus, Festus said, well, I'll have you to go back to Jerusalem and meet these men. And Paul said, oh, no, I appeal to Caesar. And once Paul said, I appeal to Caesar, all bets were off. The only thing, he's going to go to Caesar. And uh, Paul appealed to his rights as a citizen of Rome. So today, if you were to face persecution, we have certain rights and privileges that are provided by the law. Yes, use those rights. Use those privileges uh, to the best that we possibly can. Don't abuse them but use them to the best uh, that we possibly can uh, to defend ourselves and to seek protection. And there's nothing wrong with that at all as far as us trying to protect ourselves and what we're trying to do. Well, uh, I, and I make the point there's no guarantee that we will always get justice, but we can use the judicial system to ask for reasonable treatment and uh, permit us the freedom to practice our faith without fear of reprisal. The point number four there, pray. There are three aspects to our prayers. First, praying for those who are responsible for the persecution. Uh, we are encouraged to pray for our enemies. We are to try to resolve the issue with our enemies. But the Bible tells us, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Doesn't mean we're going to be able to, but we do the best that we possibly can. Uh, number two, second, pray for the strength to faithfully endure the persecution. And then third, prayer shows our dependence on God, even under the most strenuous uh, circumstances. One of the factors responsible for the growth of the early church was the willingness of Christians to die for their faith. And when others saw that, there were unbelievers who were converted uh, as a result of these people practicing their faith, being consistent with that faith. And that's very important. You know, we need to be consistent with that faith. And, uh, I, I, and, and that involves the patience and things like this. Remember that when Jesus was on the cross, Peter reminds us that when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Using Peter's word. So 
what did Jesus, Jesus said, well, y'all just go ahead and do this, and I'll tell you what I'll do in return. You just wait, old buddy. He didn't do that. He said, you will see me later in glory. And so uh, we, we do have to be careful of our response. Our response to whatever is going on with us is in the way of persecution will send a message to others. And if they, if they hear us cursing and swearing and on and on and, and threatening and things like this, they're going to say, well, he must not have been much of a Christian to begin with. How can you, this guy doesn't really believe the thing that he's preaching. So that's very important to, to be as patient as we possibly can. We can appeal to our rights and we go to God in prayer hoping that God will resolve the issue or help us to resolve the issue. Right. Right. It's just going to harden their heart even more. And the, uh, I, I, years ago, I don't remember what I was reading. I wish I could tell you where I found it. Uh, but I was reading, and somebody made the comment that hypocrisy is probably the greatest crime in Christianity. If we're a hypocrite, that will say more to people than anything else that we say or do. Right. They're just all hypocrites down there. So I'm going to the ball game instead. I'm not going, I'm not going to go to church with the hypocrites. I'm going to go to the ball game where there's 50,000 of them or something. <laughs> you know, yeah. All right. So there's things like that, and we need to uh, remember that. Let me get to the last one on page 39. Uh, if necessary, run. There's not a thing in the world wrong with running. I make the point, it's not cowardly to run from persecution, nor is it wrong. If it is, what would we say about the Christians in Acts 8 who fled after Stephen was put to death, or of Paul leaving cities to avoid death? In the passage there in Acts chapter 9, verses 22 through 25, Paul is escaping those who are trying to find him. How did he escape? Yeah, they let him down uh, Yeah, in a basket of everything. No, he didn't stop preaching. Yeah, I mean, he just basically changed location. He goes on from there. And, um, and, and there are several times uh, when Paul leaves the city and goes on his way and things and finds, as we might say, greener grass somewhere else. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to go. Yeah, he went in. Uh, there's an interesting thing. If you look at Acts chapter 19, Paul is in Ephesus, and they have, everybody goes to the theater there. They're all mad, and they go to the, uh, the theater there to, uh, they're going to, there's almost a riot and everything. And Paul wants to go in and answer the critics and things, and the brethren won't let him. The brethren, uh, they say that theater today, you can go to that, the, it's still there. You can go there and see it. But if you go there because you want to be where Paul was, you're going to be disappointed he was not there. He wanted to go, he tried to go, but the brethren uh, insisted that he not go in, and instead they send him on his way, and uh, he goes on. But, uh, but the, one of the things in Acts chapter 8, and Jason makes uh, you know, the same thing with Paul. Paul is persecuted, he leaves, but he goes on to continue preaching. Acts chapter 8, the brethren are uh, scattered because of the persecution uh, that arose about Stephen. But what does it say? They went everywhere preaching the word. And as a result of their going everywhere preaching the word, in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30, these people had done the preaching, gone so far they established a congregation, and that congregation later on in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1 is the one that sends Paul uh, on his first missionary tour. Yeah. Right. They were planting the seed, and and uh, and the, here's here's the thing. When we are persecuted, and I made this point in the 
previous lesson, one of the things about the persecution is people are going to ask questions. What are you doing here? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I tell people, most of the places I go to preach in the gospel meetings or Wednesday nights, um, this, this has only ever happened one time. I went to a church one time, and a fella came in. I was already there a little bit early. He said, who are you? I said, I'm Gary Knuckles. And he said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm going to be the speaker tonight. Oh, really? I hadn't heard of you. Who invited you? Well, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, that makes me feel wonderful. Or, or the night that I spoke at one church, and they said, do you have a PowerPoint? And I said, no. They did not turn off the monitor, and the guy in the sound room uh, in the back, the little desk that they had and everything, was going across the Internet playing games. And, and, and it's flashing up there, and I'm watching this guy. No, move, move the king of spades over here. <laughs> I was just, I, I'm trying to preach, and then I'm watching this guy play games on this monitor and everything, and I wanted to say, well, the person please operating the mind, would you please change, put a Bible verse up or something? I, and I thought, literally, I, I'm telling you the truth, literally, I prayed, oh, please don't go to a pornographic site. I, did, I didn't want to turn the guy into his elders. John? we go, uh, as we said a moment ago, we're sowing the seed. We need to be sowing the seed, and when people ask and things, what are you doing here? Well, I'm running. Why? Well, I'm a Christian, and it gives us an opportunity. Look in the conclusion here. In the second century, Tertullian wrote, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. There's a great deal of truth in that statement in Scripture. The growth of the church often resulted from persecution. Please go back in the book of Acts, start reading in Acts chapter 1. It won't happen until you get to about chapters 3, 4, and 5 right in there. But you will notice that when they have persecution and they come through this, the word of the Lord multiplied and things. So, yes, it can help. Uh, as we noted earlier, Jesus is not asking us to openly invite persecution as a means of drawing attention to ourselves. He asks that we live lives of simple obedience and that we preach the gospel to others for their salvation. But the principles of the gospel are contrary to the principles of the world, and this contradistinction will, eventually, will inevitably bring on the wrath of those around us. It generally starts when others say all manner of evil against us. So that ends the study as far as the Beatitudes themselves. Like I said, I thought I'd do a summary just to close out the year and then start the first Wednesday of uh, the new year with a different study. And I would like to have some input from you on some of these things. Uh, and more than likely, it will not be full lessons like this. This takes a long, long time. Uh, but uh, I will like study guides, study sheets, things like that to questions and maybe uh, and scriptures and things to go along with it. Was that the first bell? No. Second. Second. We're done. Merry Christmas to everyone. <laughs>